Um, I just wanted to welcome you and to um, underline um, uh, the importance of this issue of the Muslim world for Hartford Seminary, and um, I imagine for many of you as well. Um, and for Hartford Seminary, it really represents a foray into a new conversation um, and a very important conversation uh, between Muslims and Hindus. Um, and so um, we're very happy um, that it happened. Our editor of The Muslim World is here. This is Dr. Yahya Michaud. Um, and we're very happy to welcome the co-editors of this special issue and um, they will be they will be talking I'm going to go go take my seat and enjoy um, the evening uh, with the rest of you um, so um, um, this is I hope a beginning of a, of a variety of ways of having conversations um, between these important communities so a warm welcome to everyone yeah yeah so it's it's a pleasure uh, to be here and uh, to uh, introduce to you this last issue of the Muslim World Journal, April 2017. Uh, my co-editor, uh, Professor Timur Yuskayev, uh, couldn't be with us tonight, but I am sure he is with us in spirit. Uh, the Muslim World is a journal that goes back uh, to the 19th century. It started as a missionary journal. It has evolved a lot during the last decades. And what we have tried to achieve in uh, uh, the issues that uh, Timur and I have been in charge of was uh, to open new horizons, to build new bridges. Uh, so we had, for example, an issue on Islam and Judaism. We had another issue on Islam and Buddhism. And it was normal that we uh, have now an issue on uh, Hindu-Muslim relations. We are also preparing for the end of the year a special issue uh, celebrating the f uh, 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation in relation to Islam. So we want to uh, build those bridges between different communities because that's also um, the uh, finality of this institution, Hartford Seminary. And so uh, we are so pleased um, that uh, Professor uh, uh, Lucinda Moshe who unfortunately is not with us on campus as often as we would like her to be. Uh, we are so uh, grateful and fortunate that she accepted to co-edit this special issue on Hindu-Muslim relations with an old friend of mine uh, that goes back to the days where I was teaching at Oxford University, UK, uh, uh, Professor Shaunaka Rishidas, who is the director of the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies. Some 10 years ago, Shaunaka, you invited me for some Hindu-Muslim dialogue in your center, and of course, I could not have forgotten your name. And so we are also very fortunate that you accepted uh, not only your invitation to be co-editor of this special issue with Lucinda Moshe, but that uh, you were also able uh, to be here with us tonight. You didn't come to listen to me. You, li you came to listen to uh, the two co-editors, and so I'm not going to speak longer than this. And uh, the way we are going to organize the evening is I think we'll uh, start with uh, Professor Lucinda Moshe, then we will ask uh, Shonaka to speak as well, then we will open the floor for questions. And at the end, uh, to conclude, I will ask uh, the managing editor of The Muslim World, uh, uh, or colleague Nick Moumejan, without whom uh, nothing could really be achieved, uh, uh, to say a few words about the way you would be able to access uh, this special issue on the Muslim world online. So, Professor Lucinda Moshe, the floor is yours. Thank you.
Well, thank you. Uh, we're going to teeter-totter back and forth a little bit because uh, Yahya asked us to talk about you know, why, why we were interested in doing this, why we said yes, and what we hoped to achieve in this issue, what's in this issue, and what are some of our hopes going forward, what, what are its implications, what would we like to see happen next. So it began with my telling the faculty here that I was going to be as, uh, participating in a consultation on Anglican-Hindu relations in Birmingham, England in the fall of 2014, and Yahya said, well, while you're over there talking to Hindus, find us a guest editor for this special issue of the, uh, a little closer, thank you. Yeah, uh, for this special issue, we need a, need a guest editor for this special issue. And I said, fine. So over I went, and I had some conversations, and Shanika said yes. And so he should explain to you why he said yes. So <laughs> why did you say yes? Uh, bad careers advice. No, no, you have a better <laughs> answer than that. I've heard it. Uh, <laughs> so. Well, yeah. Uh, well, um, as Yakya said uh, over 10 years ago when, when uh, Yakya was in Oxford and we, we organized a Hindu-Muslim conversation. Um, and the reason was uh, we were a center for Hindu studies in Oxford. So if you're in Oxford, you're taken seriously. Um, and you have a responsibility to model seriousness. And seriousness means that Hindus and Muslims should be speaking together at a theological level. And this conversation that we'd had was a theological conversation. We can talk together um, culturally or looking at the phenomena of religion in so many ways, but very, very few conversations get deeper than you worship idols, don't you? Or, you know, you're jihadis, aren't you? Etc. And just to get beyond that and talk about the shared experience of God, the shared experience of suffering, Etc. and how do we relate to those things and uh, there's no one doing anything this this is a vir this is virgin territory um, so it someone had to do something so it was just an opportunity the Muslim world this is an established journal um, uh, I was very impressed to hear that I was kind of not impressed but it was just a, a strange coincidence that Yaki was the editor, <laughs> so a, a known quantity, so I, I knew this, this is serious stuff. So uh, yeah, it was an opportunity I thought is, had to happen, yeah. So I came back and said, yeah, yeah, I found a, a wonderful editor for this, but he would be happier to work in collaboration with somebody else, so I'll get busy now and find you a Muslim who will work with him. And the guy said, oh no, no, you do it, and I said, I'm a Christian. He's, that's okay. <laughs> so honorary Muslim. An honorary Muslim. Yeah, I've been called that too. I've been called a a, a Muslim of the Christian Madhab, and those of you. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, for whatever reason, uh, I have I have a long uh, relationship with the study of, of Hinduism. So I, I was thrilled to say yes. Actually, I didn't give it a whole lot of thought. I, I pretty much quickly said sure. Uh, and why? Uh, why would I be interested? Because I'm a weaver. I have a 48-inch floor loom in my house. And I love to take different kinds of yarn and maybe disparate kinds of yarn, things that you wouldn't expect to go together, and weave them into beautiful cloth. So this was an opportunity to do that. I love to edit. I, I edit a book series on uh, Christian Muslim comparative theology. And uh, so it's, I've got a book in process every single year. And, and so the idea of taking on another more or less book length pro project was kind of a normal thing for me. And the, the topic was intriguing. And as a Christian, uh, Yahya's right, I've been a scholar of Islam for well over 25 years, and I've been studying Hinduism for about that same period, although not as deeply as my study of Islam. But I, I'm, I'm pleased to have had Hindus say of the way I teach Hindu theology that I get it, I get it right, that I'm able to teach the breadth of Hindu theology and not, not caricature it caricaturize it. And, and so I take my, my responsibility to my Hindu friends as seriously as I take it to my, take my responsibility to my Muslim friends. So I brought that to this and was delighted with the opportunity to work with, with Shanika. So this was a chance to bring a, a, a number of interests together in a, in a brand new way. 
So what did we hope to achieve? Um, maybe I'll start on that. I, I hoped that in this issue that's now between covers, that we could bring together a number of Hindu, Muslim, and Muslim contributors. The, the list of Hindus and Muslims would be fairly well balanced, that, that we maybe not exactly seven and seven or whatever it turned out to be, but that it would be a balanced roster. I wanted those contributors to be d diverse in terms of gender, geographic location, methodology, so they're not all sociologists, they're not all historians, they're not all theologians. We've got quite an array of scholarly interest represented in, in this volume. Uh, and while I was open to any plausible topic that, that scholars might want to write upon that would fall under the rubric of uh, Hindu-Muslim relations, I wanted to be sure that at least one Muslim scholar wrote on the notion of Hindus as people of the book. And we were able to get that into, into here. So then the trick was I wanted the essays that we were able to solicit to proceed one to the next in a manner that had some logic to it. So those, those were my basic goals. Did you have some goals that you thought you were hopeful that we would re achieve as we set out to do this? Yeah, um, everything you said. Yeah, <laughs> um, and? I, I suppose uh, for me um, it, it was um, a baby step. I just, I just wanted to get a foothold into mm -hmm. the subject area. When you have, um, when it's in print, it's quotable. When it's in print, students have access to it. So it becomes a subject. Mm -hmm. it, uh, Hindu, Muslim, Muslim, Hindu becomes an area of, of worthy study the more literature you get out there. So this is a baby step. So I, I, I don't want to... Uh, I don't want to underplay the launch <laughs> uh, by saying it's only a baby step, but this is a, a very important step because mm -hmm. there's so little out there. And when you do a literature search in this area, you're really going back, in terms of theology, you're going back to the 60s, the 50s, and then you're going back to the 18th century. You know, so there's, there isn't a lot to go with. And, and for students to take this subject's area seriously, um, uh, this baby step has, has to happen. And this is in a context where this, these subjects aren't studied in India. When we talk about Hindu-Muslim, where is the area where Hindus have bumped into Muslims most, obviously, is India. And there's no religious studies of any kind in India at any level of education. So you can't critically analyze these subjects in an Indian context. And um, I would actually say that that's dangerous because you're, you're not, you're, you have a um, right-wing Hindu nationalistic politics, and then you have left-wing communist secular politics, and there's nothing in the middle. There's a, an intellectual hiatus, and there's no vocabulary of discourse when it comes to religion, which tends towards extremism, not fundamentalism. I don't have a problem with that. I do have a problem with extremism, and it becomes purely political. Uh, and that's an extreme, because religion, spirituality, philosophy, culture, which are the issues of the subcontinent, you can't speak about religion without speaking about philosophy and culture. They're, they're intertwined as they're not intertwined in the West. So even how you approach the subject area, the methodology hasn't been established academically. And this is actually not, is not good. It means that we haven't started a global dialogue intellectually or spiritually. Globalization is only happening politically and economically. And, and when, we, when we look at religious studies of Eastern traditions, not only Hinduism, but Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, Indian Islam, Indian Christianity, Indian Judaism, Indian tribal religions, Taoism, Chinese Buddhism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you, you are talking about a form of intellectual colonialism. We haven't reassessed that issue yet. And, and that's not a Western problem. It's not that the West is trying to dominate. It's that the East hasn't started to articulate, and, and that's an issue. And this issue is beginning to deal with that issue. Thank you. And in this issue, we have assembled 11 essays from an international team of scholars. Uh, and so it's my task to tell you a little bit about what's in here in the hopes that you'll then want to read all 11 
essays. We begin, it, as, as you, you're getting a sense, the typical frame for studying uh, Hindu-Muslim relations is historical or political. But what we do is we start with three essays that are um, situated within or closely adjacent to the emerging discipline of comparative theology. That's defined by Harvard University's Francis Clooney as a spiritual and intellectual response to diversity. Comparative theology combines tradition-rooted theological concerns, he says, with actual study of another tradition. There are some who would argue that the word theology is solely, or the, 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 the discipline theology is solely a Christian enterprise but we have in here Muslims and Muslim and Hindu contributors who are happy to use the term. I can let's let me yeah let's let's try this. I'm usually pretty good with microphones. So let me just see if I can get a different angle here. Is that better? Yeah. Woo. Okay. So we're talking in, in these first essays about comparative theology, uh, an intellectual response to diversity that takes each tradition deeply and seriously. Uh, and we're dealing, we've got Muslims and Hindus in, in this issue who are happy to be called theologians, happy to say that what they're doing is theology, which isn't always the case, but it is here. So the first one in this category is called Islamic Theology of Hindu-Muslim Relations by Dean Muhammad from the uh, uh, Hamid bin Khalifa uh, University in Qatar. And uh, he asserts that India's socio-religious socio history includes much that is positive, constructive, and mutually appreciative about the relationship between its Hindu and Muslim communities, and that its multifaceted, complex social culture was built by those commun communities jointly. He reminds us of times during which Indian Muslims deemed Hindus people of the book. He argues for a genuinely Islamic attitude toward religious difference that's founded on openness toward, respect for, and appreciation of Hinduism and its adherents. From there, we move to an essay by the late Joseph O'Connell of the University of Toronto. Uh, and to explore attitudes toward the other from a different perspective, he um, uh, deals with responses of members of a major Hindu sect to the Muslims they encountered during the 16th century, using the unique genre of bibliographical and hagiographical 16th century Vaishnava literature as his source material. And so this provides a study of an historical, theological, and philosophical uh, basis for further encounter. He's showing how this encounter was uh, experienced and interpreted in one century and suggests we might Use, uh, use this as a way to think about how we are encountering each other now. Then we have a comparative study of Hinduism and Islam, Jilani's approach uh, by Muhammad Modasir Ali, also of uh, the, universe, the same university in Qatar. And what he's done is he's taken an, uh, an article called Some Shared Teachings of Hinduism and Islam. It was a journal article published in 1952 by an Indian historian named Syed Manasir Ahsan Jilani. And uh, he's translated it and annotated it so that he can um, show us what was being thought of at, at that particular time. And what's interesting about it is what Jelani recommends is that we have a conversation that brings the, um, the Mahabharata into conversation with the Quran instead of the Vedas into conversation with the Quran. So that was a different move, uh, a different kind of intertextual study. And it's one that's worth replicating now. Then we move from that, that uh, genre of comparative theology into the arena of formal interreligious dialogue on theological matters. Now, dialogue is best defined as a dialectical transformative activity that, uh, and, and it's much cherished by scholars and pract practitioners who are willing to share ideas across disciplines and ready to explore mutual influences. And so when it comes to Hindu-Muslim, uh, dialogue, more depth of interaction can be achieved, it seems, if we have members of distinct branches conversing. So uh, 
there happens to be in the United States an ongoing Vaishnava Muslim dialogue, and so we have an article about that written by the two founders of it, uh, a Hindu on the one hand, Anuttama Dasa, uh, and a Muslim on the other hand, Sanaula Kirmani. They are both in the, the Baltimore area of Maryland. And they explain in their article the history and progress of this colloquium that they founded and continue to guide. And then the next article is by one of the participants, Vineet Chander, who is the coordinator for Hindu life at Princeton. And in his essay, Here Before Me is My Very Own God, Reflections on an Alternative Approach to Hindu-Muslim Dialogue, he lifts up the teachings of, of a particular uh, famous 19th century theologian and Hindu reformer and shows how that is, is applicable, how we can make present use of, of the, those ideas. So with that set of essays, we've endeavored to expand the possibilities for appreciative Hindu-Muslim theological conversation. We also suggest that appreciative and fruitful interreligious conversation can instead focus on the cultural. So, uh, and over a long period of time, there have been wonderful essays published in India and elsewhere that cover the, this cultural dimension, the, interaction, the cultural interactions, the interconnections, the mutual influence of Hindu and Muslim traditions on each other. Uh, and some of these are um, examples of interreligious, artistic, musical, literary, literary, linguistic, architectural influences that deserve further exploration. So with all that in mind, we were able to get some, some professors to go in that direction. We have several essays in this category. The first is called Mutual Learning in Lived Re Religiosity, a Case of Hindus and Muslims in the Indian Subcontinent by Muhammad Talib, a professor at uh, Oxford, and uh, Sayantani Mitra, his assistant, uh, and they argue that all the two, although the two communities differ in their theistic stances and diverge in their theological views, there's a lot of borrowing that exists between the two communities uh, that's rarely acknowledged in the orthodox traditions, and these mutual borrowings are evident at the everyday level, the, the lived practices. Uh, and so they lift that up and talk about the tensions, but also the possibilities. It's a really interesting essay. And then we move to an actual example of that sharing. Uh, Rachel Dwyer from SOAS, uh, a branch of the University of London, has an essay called Calling God on the Wrong Number, Hindu-Muslim Relations in PK and Baranji Bhaijan. Now, those are names of two really hugely popular movies, uh, one dating from PK, which came out in 2014, um, and the other one is a little more recent than that. These two Hindi films, hugely popular uh, among both Muslims and, in, and Hindus alike in the uh, Indian subcontinent, are um, an example of a particular genre of a film entertainment, but also a, a wonderful example of how, um, how difficult it is to separate religion and culture and how Hindu and Muslim um, theology and practice and culture feed each other. And so she, her, her essay really comes out of the arena of film studies and is very different then from the preceding ones. Moving even more in that kind of direction is called is an essay called Kowali in America: Religious Text or Ethnic Marker. Ethnic Marker. This one's by Hussein Rashid, the founder of the Islamicate Consultancy uh, that produced uh, the recent wonderful exhibit at the uh, Children's Museum in Manhattan about Islam. And uh, so Hussein Rashid discusses Ghazal and Kowali as cultural markers that as uh, a, uh, South Asian, as South Asians migrate to America have become two important items, two cultural items, kinds of performance that are retained and transformed in the, cult, in the context of the United States. He explains that in South Asia, uh, that, that, that um, these, these performances have a particular meaning that is then brought to, by immigrants to um, the United States, but in South Asia, they really are multi-religious sites. They, they are, uh, this is uh, art forms that are performed by both Muslims and Hindus and sometimes together, and sometimes by people who are neither Hindu nor Muslim. He's, he lays that all out for us in a really interesting way and shows how that raises questions that we can discuss further. 
So closely related to the scholarly exploration of, of interreligious cultural influences is the matter of how each community is taught about the other. Various national contexts have their own challenges to education about religious difference that will encourage mutual flourishing. This issue includes one such report. Uh, it's called Beyond Curry and Caliphs, how advocacy in education has shaped Hindu-Muslim relations in the United States. It's written, co-written by Murali Balaji of the Hindu American Foundation and Henry Milstein of Islamic Networks Group in San Jose, California. And they discuss how in recent years, outdated and distorted depictions of Islam in US textbooks, curriculum, and pedagogy, uh, and the Muslim American community's response to these distorted dis depictions has shaped how Hindu Americans have approached education reform. And it, it really gets into the politics of education reform. How do we get, how do we go about having our children's history textbooks depict our communities in an appropriate way? And so uh, how do we move away from the essentialism that's so common in teaching about religion? Then with another essay, Hindu and Islamic Economics, the need for a new economic paradigm by Walid El Ansari of Xavier University, the special issue now moves into the realm of comparative ethics. He asserts that the modern world's environmental and economic crises are, uh, result from its reductionist, mechanistic, and materialistic worldview. And he contends that a study of Hindu and Islamic economics based on their metaphysical and cosmological sciences show a path to economic justice and ec ecological equilib equilibrium that we need sorely in our day. So again, a different, different direction of study, but with lessons that are applicable right now. And then to conclude the issue, we have Sushil Mittal of James Madison University in Virginia giving us comparative religion its failures and its challenges, in which he explores from a Hindu Gandhian, Gandhian perspective the successes, disappointments, and trials occasioned by the comparative study of religions, especially with regard to Hindu dialogue with Christianity and Islam. Thus, he underscores the need for new directions in the study of Hindu-Muslim relations. So not only will more interreligious study in each of these subfields broaden our perspective, it will provide us with pathways toward understanding Muslim and Hindu traditions that can help us deal with oversimplification and lack of religious literacy. And in this issue, we make a humble effort to add to the body of literature necessary for development of a much more balanced discourse in Hindu-Muslim relations and for, uh, for facilitation of forums that can encourage such a discussion. So that's what's in here. Now, looking to the future, a number of scholars expressed interest in this project, but in the end were unable to contribute an essay. Uh, that meant This means that there are lacunae in, in our special issue. There are things that are missing. So I'd enjoy editing a second uh, Muslim world issue or a book on this topic as a chance to pull, to go back to some of those scholars and invite them to think again about the essay that they had suggested. And let's get some more essays on topics related to this general overall heading. We are ready for a second issue. Okay, well, we're on it. So what, what I like, among them, I'd like to see some essays from a Shaivite perspective specifically. I'd like to see some essays more explicitly from a Smarta position. I'd like to see a, a Shia vantage point on, on Hindu-Muslim relations. Let's, let's find some, some specific lenses that we don't have yet in here. I'd like to, uh, I, I tried to get and, and did not succeed in getting a, a piece on Caribbean, Caribbean Muslims and Hindus currently. This is an emerging conversation in a, in a new direction, and I, I think that could make for an interesting essay. Uh, I'd like an essay on Hindu-Muslim relations in the UK specifically. I'd like much more on Hindus, Muslims, and the arts, and the overlapping of, of, that, of, of Hindu and Muslim sensibilities in the arts. And I'd like an essay, more essays, on the comparison of and the intersections between Hindu and Muslim devotional life, the practices uh, that sometimes have similar forms but different meanings, or very different forms, but when you tease down in, they have very similar meanings. So that's what I'd like to see uh, going forward. What would you like to see going forward from this issue? Peace in the Middle East. Well, that, yeah. yes. <laughs> Besides that. <laughs> um, 
Uh, well, uh, all the topics that you said, I, I think, are topics that uh, could go into another issue. Mm -hmm. We could get a second level of, of writing on each of those topics. No, absolutely. Uh, and we did have a lot of people who kind of put their hand up and said interested, but time, energy, the usual thing. So 2019, would that fit? What's that? 2019. 2019. Uh, here's here's how I think. Here's how I think it'll work. Okay, we we'll think about it. I think no, it'll work. There are, there are serious people who want to get involved, but they're all busy. What's going to help them? I think a conference uh, to actually physically bring them together, and then offer them publication. And that's that's the process. That's that's how things work in scholarship. So people come to a conference. So you make it. They have to prepare a paper. Might as well write it up and get it published. But but I also think it's going to be another baby step, maybe a little bit more than a baby step, in terms of putting the subject area on the map. Because when you have a conference, again, you're showing that this is serious, it's been taken seriously. Who's taking it seriously? Certainly the Oxford Center could come in with Hartford. That's two continents. That's two institutions. <clears throat> so there's different ways that we could make this, uh, uh, make this valuable and start to up, up the subject. And unless someone does that, young scholars aren't going to take it seriously. They'll take it seriously when they see that scholarship in this area is been taken seriously by institutions, by senior scholars. So, so I think that's a way of encouraging people to write, but it's also a way of encouraging a f the field of study. And I think such a conference could be pulled off by 2019 if the interest were there on the yeah. institutional level. Certainly, yeah. Um, in terms of going forward, um, uh, I, I also think that this area is, is and I've kind of mentioned this uh, a little bit before, but it, it's touching on the area of, of religious literacy, um, which is coming to the fore. So we, we have been studying religion for so long, and we think that we've kind of got on top of it, and I think we, we've only started to scratch the surface. I don't really think that we've, we've delved deeply enough. Um, and I, I think religious literacy in this country, now that you've become Trump land, um, I, I, I think we understand that senior people in senior positions are making statements about other people that are very ill-informed. And this is, again, this is dangerous. And this is an issue of education. It's a very simple issue of education. It can be dealt with. And again, it's not going to be taken seriously unless serious people start to deal with it. Um, and people will say, well, you know, we don't have the resources and all, but as Professor Richard Gombrich in Oxford says, if you think education is expensive, try ignorance. And that's really the issue. R religious illiteracy is a major problem. Uh, we don't know who we're talking to. We have a, a political idea of what tolerance means, and it's a tick box. I spoke to a Muslim, uh, a Hindu attended the ceremony, the mayor shook hands with a Sikh, you know, and you've done it. But we don't understand these people. We don't have relationships with these people. And I'll, I'll just give you a 7-7. Um, uh, you have 9-11 here. In England, they have 7-7. Seven, seven. This was the day when the bombs went off in the tube stations and on the bus, etc. A lot of people were killed. Um, and it took a few days before the people of the, the city of Leeds realized that the bombers came from their city. And the city fathers were in trouble. They didn't know any Muslims. And there were tons of Muslims in their city. They just didn't know them. They had... They had gone to Eid celebrations and shook hands and kissed babies, and they had done all the statutory things that you got to do, and they didn't crack Muslim jokes or whatever, but they just didn't know any, and they didn't know anything about them. And the police didn't, and the fire service didn't, and the social services didn't, and they were in trouble because the people of that city, the Muslims, were in shock that people they knew had done this, their kids born and bred in that country. You know, how do you deal with How do you begin to deal with it? The only people who knew were people in the religious community and a couple of scholars. 
And the whole city became totally dependent on these people that they didn't ever take seriously before that. And they've created an infrastructure in that city that is just excellent when it comes to you know, religious literacy. They got it in extremists. And it's nearly always extremists that spurs us on. Um, and that, for Hindu-Muslim relations, um, Hindu-Muslim conflict has been an issue on the subcontinent for 120 years. Before that, interestingly, it wasn't an issue. There are historical and political reasons why it became an issue. Um, it's a fact that in the state of Bengal, academically, we, under, we, we know that a lot of people in Bengal didn't know if they were Muslim or Hindu. And they would practice as both. They would go and worship at a Muslim shrine, and they would go to a Hindu temple. And they just didn't have a problem with it. It wasn't an issue for them until the census. The British needed to know for some reason or other. And everyone had to start to identify themselves. And they started to identify themselves as Hindu and Muslim. It became a political issue and has subsequently become political and has led to communal violence. We need to know these facts. The people of Bengal need to know these facts. The people of India, the diaspora communities. I go into the Gujarati community in the UK and they're all very peaceful and pious and Jai Shri Krishna and Kim Cho and everything's, everything flows very nicely. Um, until you mention the word Muslim. And then every, everyone tightens up and goes, yeah, we're very peaceful. Not like them. You know, the whole relationship changes. You go to the city of Leicester, the, the most uh, Indian city outside of India, apart from Durban and South Africa. And it's Muslims and Hindus. They don't talk to each other at all. They have the politics of the subcontinent in Leicester. And they're trying to integrate into British society by ignoring each other. It just can't be done. Again, this is an issue of religious literacy within the Asian communities. This is not simply a white person's problem. This is a problem among the Hindus and among the, the Muslims themselves. Um, another problem is, and this is a, a Hindu problem uh, as well as everyone's, in Hindu-Muslim relations from the 15th century at least in written record, we can see that Muslims are engaging with Hinduism theologically. They're, they're translating Hindu sacred texts into Arabic and Persian. And it's going back to the Middle East and been taken seriously. Uh, yoga, yoga sutras, etc., are going back. The Hindus are doing absolutely nothing with Muslims. <laughs> they're not engaging at all. And this, again, is an issue. This is a historic issue of Hindus not taking Islam seriously theologically. And it, again, it's an issue of religious literacy. So it's a very profound issue. And it's an issue that isn't being taken seriously and isn't being resourced. And again, we have to, you know, by highlighting it, bring it to the fore so that we have the literature. Because uh, India's a growing power, politically and economically. It has to be taken seriously. But if it goes forward without taking these things seriously, what's the future and what other influences than politics and economics will it have on the globe if it's giving us a bad example of communal relations with the constant possibility of communal violence based on what we call religious issues, what I call ignorance. So there's just some, some issues going forward that without these, mm. these issues, those issues aren't going to be addressed. Uh, this is about fundamental education, fundamental research, and as I say, it's practically virgin territory. This isn't an area that's being addressed at all globally at an academic level. And it has to be addressed at an academic level because it has to be addressed critically. We have to be able to stand back from this and, and pull it apart and look at the history for what it is, look at the present for what it is, and begin to discuss it openly. So anyway, there's just some, some thoughts going forward. Thank you. So. I think we can, with your permission, Absolutely. open the floor to questions. Uh, if possible, short questions so that the speakers have time to answer as long as they want. I'll, yes, madam. Um, this is for the Senator and Speak louder. This question is for both of the editors. Um, 
What during this project surprised you or intrigued you about another person's faith? The fact that she had faith that I do more work than her. I'm not sure because because of the, the because because of my my deep experience of of teaching about both Hinduism and Islam. I'm not sure I was surprised by anything that anybody offered up about either religion per se. I was really quite delighted by uh, Hussein Rashid's article about uh, music. As, as a musician myself, I, I uh, play several play several instruments, and it's uh, my other vocation. So, to have an, a scholarly analysis of music forms that are common in India and have been brought to the United States that are shared by Muslims and Hindus and are is sort of this shared religious space was fascinating to me and now I, I'm when I hear those genres again I will appreciate them more because of, of what Hussein was able to show me about them mm. I, I um, uh, actually the question was um, what what struck us about people's faith you know <laughs> Was there anything that we didn't already know? There's tons that we didn't already know. I, I, I think what uh, impressed me most was the amount of, uh, of theological input that we got. Um, I, because the field really has been um, more cultural than anything else up to this point, sociological, historical. But... Uh, there was a lot of there was a lot of theological engagement, and that that's it's something that I've just always suspect I always suspect people are actually interested in God, um, and in modern times we have we're trying to look at different vocabularies, different pathways, but um, the interest is definitely there, and people want to talk about God, and people wanted to talk about God and these issues, and the the. The models of dialogue, the, the Vaishnav Muslim dialogue that's happening here in the States, and the, th the theoretical models were theological. They were, they were discussing God rather than the cultural phenomena that separate us that mm -hmm. kind of a lot of, a lot of people in both traditions don't take seriously anyway. You know, we just put them up as, you know, uh, I, I, the, the very first time I met a Muslim, um, it was in Dublin, and it was a very small uh, um, community from Iran and there were I, I didn't know anything about Muslims I didn't know that these ones were very strict uh, in every sense and I came along and I was dressed in a dhoti and a kurta and uh, I walked in and the everyone was very silent and the imam was sitting on, on a kind of a raised platform and and someone translated for him and uh, he said you worship gurus I, I didn't know they had a problem with this. And I said, but only in the same way that people will come to you, Imam. <laughs> you <know? laughs> and the room went deadly silent. And I, I thought, oh, did I say the wrong thing? You know? and, uh, and he said, you worship idols. And I said, well, you know, we, we worship God. Um, and God is everywhere. And the Imam said, yes. He said, he's also in the idol. And again, the room was done. <laughs> one guy at the end got up, the guy with a big beard. Sorry. And, <laughs> and he walked down. And I was sitting, you know, he walked straight towards me. He had to walk straight towards me to get out, but I thought he was walking straight towards me. I was waiting for him to take out a big sword, you know, gleam. Um, and and uh, there was dead silence, and one person said, he was upset. You know, was, <laughs> and this, this was my interaction with Muslims. I thought, ah, you know. And... The fact is that uh, these cultural issues don't really separate us if we start to speak about what we actually are interested in. And most people, when you take away the cultural, the, the barriers, what we're interested in is, is the same. We're interested in happiness. We're interested in love. We don't want 
greed in our lives. We don't want anger. We don't want lust. We don't want envy. We want to, how do we deal with these things? How do you deal with, how do you deal with these things? We are interested, and we, we may covertly have a look into the dark night of the soul or John of the, you know, Trees of Avila or some, some strange mystic from another place, you know, uh, to gain some understanding. So why can't we do that openly? You know, and and that, it, that's what I found. I found people were beginning to do this. That was, that was encouraging. And I, I think to have, to have you rephrase your question, um, I was also particularly delighted as, as someone who spends a part of every year studying Bible and Quran together with you know, some 30 Muslim and Christian scholars, um, to have it proposed that Muslims and Hindus study uh, Quran and Mahabharata together, a text I love, the Mahabharata, I often teach chunks of it when I teach about um, the religions of, of the world or comparative theology or whatever it is. Uh, but it had never occurred to me that, that that would be a fruitful, that particular conversation to study Mahabharata and Quran together uh, would be a way forward. But it would be a fascinating way forward. So, so these are the kinds of surprises that I knew there were possibilities for textual dialogues and theological concept dialogues, but to have some of them proposed that were different from the ones that had been floating around in my imagination was delightful. Right now I'm editing a book called Monotheism and Its, Com Monotheism and its Complexities, Christian and Muslim Perspectives on Affirming the Unity of God. And it occurred to me yesterday as I was thinking about what I would say tonight, we, too bad that the the sponsors of that volume wouldn't be able to engage me to do volume two, because wouldn't it be interesting if a, a book on the complexity, the mon monotheism and its complexities included a set of essays by Hindu scholars. We don't get to read those sorts of essays as much as I would like us to. And so there could be a volume by a different publisher, perhaps, that had all of the, the various uh, traditions writing about monotheism and its complexities, that would be a really fruitful and in interesting set of essays. There were other questions, yeah. Uh, Who did you, you saw, yeah. Yeah, I'll take the lady, then Dr. Shakibahi, and then the gentleman here. In that. Louder, please. Power? Power? Yeah. Uh, but, okay. So she's she's saying that she noticed that the essays in this don't seem there seems not to be an engagement with the notion of power, the the matter of power. None of these e essays seem, from what I said about them, to to address the very important dynamic that power brings to Hindu Muslim relationship. And I did allude to the fact that the normal if there's a normal frame, a normative frame for looking at Hindu-Muslim relationship, it generally is through a lens of, of power, historic, uh, as an historical lens, a an, an socioeconomic lens. And the scholars that came forward for this issue uh, were not so much interested in that lens because if there is any literature out there already on, Hin on Hindu-Muslim relation, it's that kind of literature that is looking at the power dynamics, the political dynamics between the two groups. And so what we have here instead is a set of essays mostly looking at the theological in intersections that might surprise readers that you wouldn't expect that there would be uh, and the cultural, but you're right, there could be uh, we have 11 essays here. We could have 11 more essays, each of them taking some aspect of that, that power dynamic, and that would make a really interesting book, too. It, partly, it's a matter of when you put together an edited volume like this, you're somewhat at the mercy of who will say yes. 
and, and then who not only says yes, but turns in their essay. <laughs> so so there, were, there were topics that I would love to have had in here, but they didn't get, uh, they didn't get produced in time. Uh, so that's why we could totally have a second volume, a second issue uh, to parallel this one. And your point is very well taken, and there could be essays that, that, that go in that direction, very definitely. You want to add something, Shonaka? Um, well, uh, just to say that Lucinda and I had decided that, you know, as, as she said, that was going to be the focus of this, uh, of this issue because um, everything out there is about the power politics between Hinduism and, and Islam, and it really trips up the discourse. There's, there's nothing else to go with. So everyone's arguing about power. They're doing it to this day with Pakistan and India. They're looking at each other with nuclear weapons ready to press the button. You look at the state of Kashmir, there's so much discourse about power between Hinduism and Islam that we wanted this to be just about a different subject. That was, that was really yeah. the focus. So, yeah. I think if I understand what you're talking about, she's saying she's talking about personal power be between religions. I think if you read especially, um, which essays in here would do the best with that? Uh, I know f um, the, the essay on um, comparative economics, and, definitely. And, and to leave and return. Yeah, and, and uh, the one on mutual learning and lived religiosity, absolutely. That, that one is going to go in that direction for you. And the third one that goes in that direction in an interesting way is the, the Korean caliphs one that talks about how active is it, how, how one community got enraged with the way their, uh, their kids' textbooks read and, and took action. And the other community said, oh my gosh, we could take action too. And, and here's why we should. And here's this, this in, the boundary becomes m more a meeting place. Uh, one, one, of my, uh, uh, one of the people that influences my thinking at the moment talks about the, the boundary, the margins as the, the active creative place. And, and there is this margin, this boundary between um, Hindus and Muslims in the United States, but there's also an active uh, center there as they come together as two communities with uh, sometimes similar ethnic histories and sometimes not, but both as minority communities in this country that are often mischaracterized, there's uh, some creativity that bubbles up. So that's a, a different exercise of power. I hope that helps you, but I think you'll find as you read the essays, there's more to each of them than my capsule explanation could possibly have told you. We had Thank you. Dr. Shakibari. There are significant differences in the theological aspect of Hinduism and Islam. And if you look at it at the street level, or temple and Muslim, at the mosque level, it is almost impossible to come to some kind of general agreement. At the academic level, it's easier to get to some kind of common aspects of both worldviews. Do you think that for the for sometimes to more or less contribute to uh, resolving some of the problems of our time, the two religions and other religions pay more attention to the problems that we are dealing with in society and try to see whether they can contribute to resolving those problems. Of pollution, of poverty, of war, uh, discrepancy of the power, and well, that's where I find um, Walid Al Ansari's essay fascinating, because again, his essay is called um, I've got to pull it out here: uh, Hindu and, and Islamic Economics: The Need for a New Economic Paradigm. And he's he's talking not just about uh, economics in terms of fun finance, but he's also talking about ecology, and, and he's talking very theoretically as only he can do, but in, in beautiful philosophical terms, but his, his message is deeply, deeply practical. So I would really commend that to you, and I think that he's laying out a foundation in his essay for what could, in, 
could become a, a book-length treatment by a number of scholars. How do we, how do we bring this down to, to the, the, the grassroots of our communities that desperately need better ways of interacting for the, the, the health of us all? So uh, again, we're, we're fortunate to have had some contribution that I think really is, is at the practical level, at the grassroots level. It's presented by scholars, so it may read up here in the clouds, but if you think about what they're trying to say, it's very practical and, and, uh, and comes back down to the, the, the piety of the everyday Muslim, the everyday Hindu who are next door neighbors in you know, Clay County, Florida, where I live. But if I can add something, mm -hmm. this journal is not published by the United Nations. Mm -hmm. but by an interreligious school. <laughs> so, sir, please, for your question. No, it was very interesting. I, I just don't have questions, but I have a couple of comments. If I okay. Know. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, the thing is, what do we need? Now, we need uh, a mutual acceptance is what is necessary. Near tolerance is not the way. You know, just I tolerate you, mm -hmm. but that is not enough. We should have mutual acceptance, total acceptance. That is where all the religions fall apart. Is that, you know, I tolerate you, mm -hmm. but I don't accept you. That's what, that's not said, that portion is not said. But most important is that we should have total acceptance. Of it. And that's where all this class occurred. Again, you know, I could not help you know, writing it down. The book, the Judeo-Christian religions have got the book. Whereas we, you know, as a, as a Hindu I'm talking about, is that there is no single book. We have to go back to the Vedas and the Mahabharatas and etc. of the old Smritis and Srutis and there are different, different things mm -hmm. that go down to. And there is no single author to it. Mm -hmm. This was all due to meditation, how the, mm -hmm. you know, the Rishis found out. And the explanation of the Vedas is given in the Upanishads and there are 18 Puranas. And, you know, I, I, I don't want to go into that. So that is not going to be, you're not going to get it, unfortunately, from the Ivy League universities. We have to get down to the grassroots of the people who are there and practicing the religion. And you know, and you are written down. We have volumes and volumes of mm -hmm. things written by Adi Shankara and others. The revival of Hinduism is not a recent phenomenon, but it is, you know, it's a reaction is what is happening in India. You mm -hmm. know, because Totally submissive is not, you know, if you're there and the kids are being bullied, and that is what is happening. I'm not trying to support that, you know, that that's the right way to do it. Hinduism is more than Vaishnava, it is it's a, it's a really a monotheistic religion. And we have different forms of, we don't believe in numerous gods, we don't believe in, even in one god, we believe only in God. <laughs> and when you take that, Every religion is the same. We all believe the same thing. We call it by different names. And, you know, uh, if you want, you know, for your reference, you are looking at it. Just you may want to look into Hinduism today. You know, there's a magazine called... Oh, I'm today. deeply and, familiar with that, yeah. Yeah, and then Hinduism today, you know, they, you can get some ideas about it. And there are, uh, if you want to go into the Sai rights part of it, there is a Asha Vidya Gurukula mm -hmm. in... Uh, Pennsylvania, and there are so many, you know, from... Right. Thank you. They, could I ask... Yeah. yeah, could you... Could I ask Shonaka to uh, comment first uh, on the first comments and Lucinda Sorry. on the second part? On the first part, which part particularly do you want to comment? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think you said that we all believe in the same thing. That's just not true from a Hindu point of view. Um, and from a Hindu point of view, with the idea of Atma, of the self, that we are all eternal individuals. So as eternal beings and individuals, then each one of us has an individual perspective, which means that there are as many religions in this room as there are people, constitutionally. So hence there's so many books in Hinduism. Hence there's no central authority because everyone is an authority unto themselves. We make our own choices which goes against the claim that we all believe the same thing. We definitely don't all believe the same thing. And that's, that's a given. We all have an individual relationship with the Supreme. We understand it differently. The Supreme may enlighten us, and we may not even get it. You know, so 
it, I, I just kind of throw that back a little bit. For us to do proper dialogue and, as you say, acceptance, acceptance has to be based on respect. And we have to respect the difference. And, and it's not in that sense all one. That can be a spiritual concept, but the practical reality we live in is that I'm tall and someone else is small, someone's fat, someone's thin. You know, we're just different. And we, we really have to deal with that. We can legislate about equality, but it's not real, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. we, we have to live with the difference, and we have to understand that that's real. And if someone wears, you know, different a beard, and I don't wear a beard, and stuff, or different clothes, or different cuisine, it really doesn't matter. That's fine. You know, what are the issues that we can discuss that are common to us all? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and there are some very basic issues that are common to us all. And, and I think there's, that's where we should, and this gentleman here talked about practical things. Yes, that's where we have to get to. Now, both of you kind of said, well, you can talk about this academically. Um, and you kind of said it in a little dismissive way. The fact is that we have to talk about things intellectually to get perspective. And, and we cannot leave our intelligence out of discourse. We have to include the academy. And as Lucinda said, these are academically presented, but very practical. You, you can do something with practically every article. Some are telling you how to engage in dialogue, in you know, ABCs. So people have to do this thinking for us because we don't have time. And we, we, need, we need people to reflect. They're not solving the problems of the world. They're just giving us perspective. So I wouldn't take it out of the equation. It's not the full picture. But when I said baby steps, we definitely need guidance when it comes to Hindu-Muslim relations because we're not doing a good job as it is. And I just, if I can just cap that off and then we'll get to this question. Uh, I totally agree that tolerance, as that word is usually understood, is, is not enough. We need to go beyond that. The way I teach about it, and I think the way we, we try to encourage it here at Hartford Seminary, is, is what we're, we're after is uh, helping people to delight in our deepest differences. How can we delight in our differences, be curious about our differences instead of dismissive of them or, or so off-put that that we demonize the the other who who does things thinks things differently from us. The other thing that we that I certainly want from my students, and I think we encourage across the board here, in um, at Hartford Seminary, is something that uh, uh, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, used to say: We need to get be uh, we need to raise the quality of our disagreement. We need to improve the quality of our disagreement. And uh, someone out at Fuller Seminary in California said, what we need more is, is um, convicted civility. We need to be, hang on to our convictions. Uh, it's not about letting go of our distinctiveness as Hindus and Muslims, but can we be civil in the way we discuss them and, and, and encouraging of each other in sharing what is, is dearest to each other's hearts. So that's why it was so important to have an article in this in this volume about those times and places when Muslims looked upon Hindus as people of the book, people who had a revelation straight from God in the way that Muslims understand the Quran to be that precious. Of course it came in a different way. Of course the Vedas and the Quran are very different forms of literature and, and their histories are different. But if, 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 if Muslims in a given society can say of Hindus, they have revelation that is equally precious to them as the Quran is to us. That's a big step. And that needs to be said more and more in our day, I believe. And, and so I was really delighted that one of the first, uh, that one of the essays that was offered up to us took on that very topic without my asking. Uh, and I, I just had hoped that there, that would be one of the essays in the, the mix, and indeed it is. So it's all about how do we, what, what I like to say is how do we move toward our mutual flourishing? How do we flourish together better? Uh, and, and there are different approaches to encouragement of that in here, and that's why I hope you will read each essay with due seriousness. We had another question. No, I th yeah. this gentleman, please. 
Maybe start with this table. I have read the journal, so very mm -hmm. much. And uh, after that, I'm going to make an assumption, and this is purely based on what I'm hearing. It appears to me that this scholarship is biased more towards discovering similarities rather than discovering differences. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm wrong, but I'm making a hypothesis here. So maybe there are some articles in the journal who really take it upon them to really ask the question, what are the differences? Number one. Maybe then we can ask the questions, are those differences, how they being dealt with? Are they being tolerated? Are they being accepted? Mm -hmm. And what is the role of theology in accepting those differences and tolerating those differences? And does that particular stance result in the political chaos and the political consequences we see today? These are the questions I'm asking. Mm -hmm. and, um, it is one thing, so maybe there is a certain set of theology that says, hey, difference is good. I know you, uh, you're talking about something very different from mine, but I know even though you're talking about something very different, it is very simple, it is the same thing, it's a manifestation of something I really hold dear, maybe something called God. As opposed to, you know what, I have a conception of God and I'm going to believe only in that, and I'm sorry, I don't believe in your conception. So I'm trying to get to that issue where in the, are these conflicts really stemming from differences in theological stances about accepting other forms of God and celebrating them? So that is the question. Has any of your articles explored that particular relationship? I think you need to read the journal. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you need to read it. I mean, in... in, in yeah, yeah. In any in, in any good. Um, it, no, you, you you should read the whole thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. In, I, I, in, yeah. In any good um, kind of theological discourse, everything you're discussing is discussed. You know, it's it's critical. So it's it's not just looking at the positive. It's not affirming a truth. It's not sectarian. It's not politically motivated. It's really a, a discovering what's there, theologically. Yeah. And it, it could be I'm a I'm a Hindu talking about Hinduism. I'm a Muslim. That's that's fine. We we can still critically analyze our own traditions, and you, you'll see that being done. And you'll see yeah. people looking at both sides of everything because you have to. Yeah, you, otherwise, it's not an intelligent discourse. The, and I think. Yeah, and I I can say from from my my students would probably recite this. You know, <laughs> there is such a thing as a formal comparison and a functional comparison. I try to get students to to see that when we're comparing, we can compare form to form, and that may not get us very far. It may look the same in your religion, but it may have a different meaning in your religion than it does in mine. That's an important thing to take note of. The, the functional comparison, something that looks very different in my religion may function for me as a Christian the way yours does for you as a Buddhist, for example, and this, this other very different thing seems to function for you. The functional comparison is as important as the formal comparisons. So the, 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 the things that look alike or sound alike aren't always the best things to pair. So that's part of the, the whole critical way of looking. And I think that, that some of the essayists in here do get at that sort of thing. What I don't think any of these authors are after, and what I'm certainly not after, is uh, a washing away of the differences. What I do expect is that, let's just talk about our, our, our counts of God. What do we mean by God? It's not that you buy into the way I understand and talk about God, rather that you are able to appreciate how I do it enough to mirror it back to me, perhaps, and say, yeah, I get what you're saying. I don't buy it. I'm going to keep on doing it my way, but I get what you're saying now. I understand. And, and that's part of why the theology essays in this volume, this issue, are, are so in interesting and important, is we have Hindus and Muslims trying to explain to each other in a way that the other person can hear and then mirror back and appreciate, even if they never buy it, it doesn't, they don't make it their own, but they can appreciate it, explain it, and make sense of it in a, in a fresh way. That's delighting in the differences. So there's a lot of delighting in differences that goes on in here. Uh, it's, it's more than delighting in differences. It's understanding the differences and its downstream consequences and understanding that it is not about delight, it is about Understanding them, seeing its impact. 
Well, that's where you put can, it. Yeah. Can I, yeah. I, I can perhaps add something mm -hmm. uh, about that with a metaphor. When you build a bridge, it's usually between two different sides of the river, not the same side. So you can't go for the similarities without automatically also taking into account the differences. Yeah. And with every, with every bridge, there is a gulf underneath. And so there, there, every, everything that we construct in any of these comparative projects, whether they are economically or historically or theologically driven, is going to have to address that which separates us. And, and you can't avoid that. But it's about tone of voice that I, that I think that is, uh, you'll find no polemics in here. Yeah, I think we need to. We still have a question over there. Uh, perhaps we still have time for two questions, two short questions. One is for you, sir. Um, <clears throat> you feel that Islamic scholarship, I'm not so much aware, but it seems that there may be different schools in that field, one perhaps more in the fundamentalist or more, you might even say, extremist sort of point of view. Did you, were you able to bring, you know, uh, real in-depth, theologically committed scholars to the Islamic world, interacting with it, it is, or is it more people that are, are uh, more academically oriented and not so? The ones that I know personally, the, the Muslims I know personally that contributed they are all scholar believers. They are deeply committed to their religions. Uh, Walid Al Ansari is an example. Uh, what would you say? Oh yeah, I'm, uh, I mean, I think nearly everyone writing for this is committed to their faith, the Hindus and the Muslims. So it, it's, th these are people who are scholars, but are also engaged with the tradition. Um, and, and I would say, you know, you say two schools of Islam, one is more extreme. There's hundreds and thousands of schools of Islam, and. And a lot of them aren't extreme, you know, so I, I just think it's it's com it's complex, yeah. and it's complex in every religious Same tradition that I've ever looked at, and it goes back to there as many religions as there are people in the room, there as many Muslims as there are people in the mosque, you know, many different types of Muslims. So I I think that's reflected here, uh, and these are intelligent people of faith, discussing their tradition from different uh, perspectives some historical, some theological, some cultural, some even economic, ethical. So it's, it's, a, good, it's a good breath. Yeah. And for obvious reasons, we could not ask Osama bin Laden and, and others uh, to write an essay for this journal. So you might understand that as well. So have we got a last question? Yes, madam. Um, off the top of my head, no. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that it would take, as it did for this, it took considerable number of months of research to find out who was doing anything that was vaguely related to the kind of overarching theme we could imagine for this issue, and then contact them and convince them with some amount of arm twisting to take time from their busy schedules to write us a piece. So it would take some research to find the people that are doing that, but that's why I attend the AAR, the American Academy of Religion annual meeting, because that's a, a place where you can kind of scope out papers that might be leading to larger essays that might then qualify. But it's, a, it's an area of particular interest to me, so it's something I will be watching for this fall as I, as I go to that meeting. Thank you, Shonaka. Thank you, Lucinda. Before concluding, because I know that each of you now wants to read the full content of the journal. I'll ask Nick Mumejan, come Nick, please, or uh, managing editor to tell you how that is possible. Yes, I'll just take a few moments before we leave. There's a flyer that if uh, you haven't already received it at the table um, as you come in, there's uh, this flyer. Um, down here at the bottom of the flyer, there's an abbreviated URL. It's a very quick link to access this journal. We have made this journal free 
All the PDFs for the articles are free until the end of the year. So throughout 2017, you're able to access every single article for the special issue. Um, we've also highlighted some of the other special issues we've done uh, for interfaith dialogue, including uh, Judaism and Islam in America, Christian Muslim political thought, um, and also uh, Buddhist uh, Muslim engagement. So you're more than welcome to, to access these articles. But if you would like to continue to read the, the articles of which we've talked about without having a physical copy, grab one of these flyers. They're free on the way out. And then this URL down here in the corner will give you free access to every single article they've uh, discussed. And then you're more welcome to engage with that. Thank you very much for all attending. And thank you to our uh, panels and guests. Thank you. Okay. okay. I will, one minute, one minute, please. So I will conclude. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Shonaka. Thank you, Lucinda. Uh, thank you for, uh, to you who are recording on video this evening. I think we have started something new uh, by having this uh, inauguration of this new special issue on Hinduism and Islam. We didn't do anything similar for a special issue of the Muslim world until now. But I consider it is very important to look at Islam, not just from the point of view of Christianity and Judaism, a Western point of view, let's say. Islam is present in Asia, the greatest Muslim countries uh, in terms of population are in Asia. And what we wanted to do as well was to open a new window, Islam seen from the other side, not from the Western side, from the Eastern side. And of course, uh, we, we are very welcome to write to us at Hartford Seminary, the Muslim world, if you have any more comments or uh, remarks or uh, hopes. We hope, as we have heard, that uh, you will accept uh, to uh, co-edit the second volume you were speaking about. And uh, on our side, we will try to see uh, if we can uh, indeed have the means to organize the conference that you were speaking about. I cannot promise anything, <laughs> but uh, we'll look at it. And so have a good evening, everybody, and thank you for attending. And know that some of you have come for the first time to the Hartford Seminary. I hope we'll see you again. Thank you. Thank you.